Welcome to Andy Staples on three. Happy Tuesday. Happy John Calipari meeting with his boss, Mitch Barnhart Day. But we're pretty sure John Calipari is going to stay Kentucky's coach because I don't think Mitch Barnhart, who is the one of the more staid and conservative, and I'm not talking in a political sense, I just he, he does not do outlandish things. I don't think he'd let John Calipari go on his coach's radio show on Monday night and act as if he's going to be the coach next year if he's not going to be the coach next year. That that would be very surprising. We've seen surprising things before, but that would be very surprising. But we're going to have Nick Roush from Kentucky Sports Radio on later in the show to break down that John Calipari radio show. There's still a lot of folks in Kentucky still mad. I think Nick's one of them that – the season did not end the way they wanted it to. It has not ended the way they wanted it to for a while. And it's one of those situations where the expectations are Kentucky at Kentucky are what they are. It is to win national titles. It is to compete for national titles if you were not winning them. And it feels like even though Calipari has made some changes, has, has done some different things the last few years, the results have always been the same. And that's, I think, where the source of frustration is. And you know, the guy who came in, who understood kind of how to play the game with the boosters and with his bosses, he got a little too big for that. And now he's got a lot of people angry and probably not as many friends as he would have had. So it's going to be a pretty awkward and uncomfortable offseason in Lexington because, again, I don't think that they would let him go on that radio show if they were planning on firing him and paying a $33 million buyout or you know, less if he gets another job. But still, a titanic amount of money if they've got to wind up paying it all. So we'll find out. But the NCAA tournament continues without Kentucky. Great Sweet 16 coming up. How do you watch that Sweet 16? Well, with Prime Video. Watch every game live on your phone, on your laptop. You can relax, watch at home, on your TV. All of it with Prime Video with a subscription. One password because what you do is you subscribe to Prime Video. Then you use the add-ons for Max and Paramount Plus, which would give you all of the tournament games within your Prime Video app. One app, not switching back and forth. One password it would be so easy. And oh, by the way, yeah, new Roadhouse course jake gyllenhaal as the new dalton they move it from i believe the first one was in kansas the originals in kansas this was in the keys i can't wait i haven't had time because i've been watching the tournament but one of these days i'm gonna get to watch that one too because i of course am a prime video subscriber you can be too click the link in the show description if you're watching on youtube or if you're listening on your favorite podcast platform the link will be in the show description. Just give it a click and they will show you the rest of the way. Now we have a very special guest today. Great interview. Before we talk to Nick Roush about the whole John Calipari situation, we're going to go to another basketball school, but it's a basketball school that is on its way to maybe becoming an everything school. And it is very much in part because of the guy we're going to talk to, Lance Leipold. He's Kansas's head football coach. And let's be perfectly real here. He's a miracle worker. Because three years ago, Kansas fired Les Miles. They fired Jeff Long, the athletic director. It was as spring practice was ending. They were the worst team in the Power Five. They might have been the worst team in the FBS. Lance Leipold came in and immediately changed all of that. And now he's got a team that is expecting big things, that is expecting to win every time it takes the field. Very exciting quarterback in Jalen Daniels. This is something that seemed impossible three years ago when he got the job. You talk to him, you don't get a lot of flash. You don't get a lot of, you know, he's not a salesman. He's just a guy who goes in and builds programs, whether it's Wisconsin, Whitewater, Division Three, whether it's Buffalo, and now Kansas. It's been pretty incredible to watch. Now you can hear him explain how they've gotten there, what they're doing, why it works, 
Here's Lance Leipold. We are joined now by Kansas football coach Lance Leipold and uh, construction going on all around. The Jayhawks are actually out of their home for this season. You got games at Arrowhead Stadium. You got games where the MLS team plays in, in Kansas City, but they are building this massive new stadium entertainment complex where David Booth Memorial Stadium stood. Lance, I got to think that's not happening unless you guys are winning some games here. Well, first of all, Andy, great to be with you, and, and thanks for saying that. Uh, you know, it's definitely exciting times for us right now, and uh, kind of like we had just said a minute ago was, uh, it not, you know, I think definitely the success of the last couple seasons has is, is definitely helped this momentum. And, and from the time we named the, uh, announced the project to the time that we actually started moving on stuff, to me, is by far the fastest I've ever been a part of. And it's really, truly exciting to see see what's going to happen. Now, in the meantime, yeah, there's going to be some inconveniences, um, and especially with home games next year. We did experience a little bit of that last year when we renovated our locker room and weight room to kind of jumpstart this project. And it's really helped our players kind of adapt to what some of these things can be. And I'm really proud of what they've been able to do here the, these uh, three months or so of the second semester. The most interesting part of the, the contract is, so you have this deal to play your Big 12 games where the Chiefs play. Mm -hmm. It's in the contract that if you host a playoff game, it's going to be at Arrowhead. And I realize as a coach, you don't want to think about that at all. But I, I got to say, Travis Goff, your AD, I, I appreciate that he's looking at that and going, you know what? I feel like these guys are, are in a position to think about these things. Yeah, it you know, when that came out, I put it this way. I was not privy to any of that being even part of the language. It was never in a discussion of, you know, even behind the closed doors, hey, what happens if, you know, if everything lined up correctly and, and that on the field. So it's exciting, you know, and, and again, these, you know, especially places with natural grass that share stadiums. I know Lincoln Financial in Philadelphia and that when, when you ask somebody to, to be able to use their field and, and, and do those things uh, on a Saturday and there could be a Sunday home game, um, it, it takes special cooperation, and and that's gonna. You know, I can we can't thank the Chiefs enough. Uh, Children's Mercy Park, as you mentioned, in Kansas City, Kansas, um, where Sporting KC plays. Uh, you know, for our first two games, our two non-conference games should be an exciting, more intimate, uh, uh, you know, uh, stadium to play in, and it still should be exciting. And uh, we'll make the best of it. Yeah, that, that UNLV game, by the way, everybody, don't, don't, don't sleep on that one. Those guys are, are very good. Barry Odom's got a good team. So that that could be a very cool, cool game in a very intimate setting. But you know, when you look at this, you're essentially starting in a new league now with all that the Big 12 was brought in last year and this year. How, how different does it feel when you look at your schedule and you see conference games against Arizona State and Colorado to go along with Houston and, and teams that, that weren't there two years ago. Yeah, when you really look at it again, the the oddness, I guess, or uniqueness of taking this job over in May of of twenty one, and then we add, you know, then we add some teams, then we now we're adding more teams. This job continually changes, as and and we don't even have to relocate. So it, it'll be exciting. It's different. I, I guess even from my my small college days of, I've always enjoyed just you know, competing against different people, different venues, I think gives you different experiences. Um, I, I just think it, it's going to continue to get better and better. And and I think, I don't know if the word parity is, but matchups are going to be, you know, there's always talk of the two teams that just departed about their resources versus everybody else. And I think it's a little bit more on level ground and it, it's made it exciting. And I, I think it'll continue to be that way. I will point out that you did beat those teams a couple times on their way out. So that we don't have to worry that much about it, but, but you're right. I I'm, I'm very excited about the big 12 schedules this year. I, I imagine as a coach, it is not as much fun when you look at it and you see that these are all games you can lose. These are, these are every team you play is going to be a team that can beat you. Absolutely. I, I think that's part of what people, you know, 
I'm really proud of what our staff and our players have done here in the last two years, Andy. But uh, I think we can get way too far ahead of ourselves. We just start looking at how games could really play out because of the, again, the way people can, can put things together. You can look at Baylor a couple of years ago, they were picked ninth and win the, in the league and they win the conference. You look at what TCU did in Sonny's first year. There's going to continually be those type of teams that in, and I'm, I'm sure we're mentioned in those type of conversations of teams that maybe surprise people. So you have to be ready. You have to stay grounded and, and be able to go. And, and as you say, you know, you mentioned Arizona state, but you know, two weeks earlier, we go all the way out to Morgantown. Then you go the other direction. And I, I just think, uh, you know, that's, that's today's uh, new college football at this level. And, and I think those are going to be things that we're going to have to learn and tweak and look at no matter how many, it may be four years before you do it again, but you got to keep in mind, Okay, what's it like on the body? What time are the kickoffs? What are those going to be? And and we've got to be smart on how we practice, how we travel, and, and do all those things because that could pay dividends uh, for you late in the season. So you you mentioned your your small college experience, and and for those who don't know, and I if you haven't read up on on Lance Leipold, six national titles at Wisconsin Whitewater in in Division three. You look at Kalen DeBoer, who won an NAIA national title, takes Washington to the national title game last year. Now he's the Alabama coach. Uh, Chris Kleiman, obviously great career at North Dakota State. He's won the Big 12 at Kansas State. When when these jobs open up, do you, do you want to call the ADs and say, hey, guys, <laughs> you notice a trend here? Yeah. Yeah, you know, there's others that, that as well. You know, O'Brien well, well, Kelly, you know, he started yeah. at Grand Valley Grand State, State. You know, and yeah. Chuck Martin did some of that. There's guys there. And but I think, you you know, it it gets talked about more, especially because of Kalen's success and which is so great and, and so happy for him is uh, I just think, though, when you when people hire people with that they know or backgrounds that they're comfortable with. And I, I think sometimes, you know, um, it can be used. It's looked at a, at a risk. I think a lot of times, you know, right, wrong or indifferent. Division three can be looked at as being closer to high school football than it is to power five football, power four football. And sometimes, you know, you can go all the way back to Jerry Faust experience, uh, experiment if, if people are, are sometimes not going to take that chance. So sometimes you do. And, and I've said I'll be forever grateful for, for Danny White and because and Danny's, you know, is, is an outstanding, I think, administrator and for and he's all, always going to be thinking outside the box. And he did. And he gave me a great opportunity at Buffalo. Well, and that's I, I t I've talked to Danny about that whole situation. Danny's the, the AD at Tennessee now. He was the AD at Buffalo uh, when you got hired. And he, he explained exactly what his thinking was, is I can get a Big Ten position coach who may not understand the CEO parts of this job, or I can go find a very successful CEO and bring that person in. And that's, that's yeah. how he wound up in your living room. Yeah. It's, and, and, and fortunately for, for, for me and our family and, and our staffs that it worked out that way. And, and I think that's one thing, and it depends on what you're looking for. It, it really does. I, you know, I, I've been, I've been very fortunate, uh, you know, our, Andy Cole, Nicky was our offensive coordinator, just moved on to Penn State, but he's with us 11 years. And you know, Brian Borland's been, we're going on 18 years as being the defensive coordinator. There's guys in this hallway. I've worked longer than probably twice as long as most marriages even last, you know? So <laughs> there, and we spend a lot more time together sometimes, unfortunately, than we do our own spouses. So, you know, having continuity, having respect, uh, being on the same page, egos in check, and still finding ways to be successful is a balancing act. And, and, and uh, you know, we've been grateful to do that at a few spots and we continue to, to want to plug away at doing it. So you mentioned Andy, your offensive coordinator heading to, to Penn state. Mm -hmm. And that is, you know, you've had so much continuity with this staff since you've gotten there, but I do wonder, you know, it's obviously a great opportunity for him, but then you bring in Jeff Grimes, who's been at a bunch of places at, at Baylor at BYU at Auburn, you know, you, you name it. He's got a long career. Uh, Andy Reid was actually his position coach yep. at, at UTEP. Uh, but what's it like now with some some new ideas or, or kind of a fresh look at, at what you guys have been doing yeah. very well? Yeah. And I'll, I'll just kind of add in as well. We, you know, DK McDonald is coming in as our, our corners coach from the Philadelphia Eagles, and he spent 
think it was up to eight years, six to eight years with uh, Matt Campbell at Toledo and Iowa State, and then now time in the league. To have two guys like that, I, I think, you know, Andy, it's really it, it's really a, a, a bonus for us because, you know, the first three years, you know, really emphasizing continuity and what we needed because this program hadn't had any in so long, from head coaches to position coaches to everything. But also now that we've gone into year four, it has forced me to make sure that we're 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 hitting on the little things, our practice expectations, what we're doing, little details that sometimes can slip away from you when you think everybody's always on the same page if they've been in the building with you for for multiple years. So, and like you also alluded to, I always enjoy when even in our analyst role or other support staff roles, when other guys come in from other programs, asking them about how it was done at other places. And, and I think that's the only way that you can learn and grow. And uh, though we've we've enjoyed the way we've done it and, and, and the successes that we've been able to have from time to time, but, at, but at, we, we're far from having all the answers and having this whole thing figured out. Well, and the other thing I think, it, it, you know, your offense is, is still your offense, and even though Andy's not there, but I've, I, I'm always interested by the way that you play a fun brand of football, but you are very, you know, very much harping on fundamentals, on the little things, on that. You know, people look at you as, as this program builder, like get the little things right, but then you watch you guys play and you're playing two quarterbacks on the field at the same time. Yeah, I, I think those are some things that we made ourselves unique. We wanted to have player engagement. We wanted to have a little fun with it. Um, you know, there's things that are window dressing and there's things that, that can be used in those formations. And that's what we kind of like. And and we just continue to evolve with in, in different ways. And and uh, and and when, you know, talking with Jeff Grimes about the position, that's I I've, I like some of the things that his Baylor offenses had done in the past. And I think they could be nice additions. But, you know, part of part of the, I guess, requirements of being being involved in this job was we are going to continue to do the things that we do. And that's motion shifts, personnel groupings. And, and here's, you know, just a short example. I don't know if I've said this to you before in the past, but we played a non-conference game two years ago against, now two seasons ago against Houston. And mm -hmm. in that game, we were fortunate to win. Don't remember the the by how much, but it wasn't a lot. And we had 11 different players catch passes. And it really wow. resonated me that the more personnel groupings, the more people on the field, the more touches that people get, guess what? You build depth. Your morale's better. Things happen. Kids think they have a chance. And everything that we're doing, and it's not like, hey, let's make sure player 9, 10, and 11 get a quick touch here. It just happened to evolve through the thing, and and it and it became part of our 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 identity. We always wanted to be multiple enough that we could play to our strengths of the current season of whatever personnel grouping that was. That's been our that that's really been our philosophy since Whitewater. I remember covering Urban Meyer early in his career, and he would talk about that about how many different receivers would get touches during a game, and and what and the goal was always double digits. You didn't try to force it, but he he explained how. One that mentally keeps everybody engaged. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I may get my shot here, but also at practice all week mm -hmm. keeps everybody engaged. Exactly, and I think you know our offensive staff. You know, last year led by Andy, and now now by Jeff. I think that becomes very important on Monday and Tuesday, because when you get a chance to see that you're in a couple personnel groupings on Monday and Tuesday, guess what? You're locked in. You're more focused. You're not waiting to see if something happens to fall your way on Wednesday or Thursday. You never know. And then all of a sudden, you know, your player engagement, like I said before, your morale's better. And guess what? Guys compete harder and you're building yeah. better depth. And 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 also, even some of the guys that play a lot, you know, if, if Joe's doing a great job and in this small package he's been given, guess what? I better be on top of my game or he's going to get some more of my reps. Yep. No, it's, it, it is fun to watch. And it, it's amazing to me. I was going back just to get the exact date of your hire in 2021. It was April 30th, like spring practice is done. How, how did you get this thing off the ground you know, as quickly I, as you did? You know, we were done with our spring practice at Buffalo. Um, I got offered the job at like 745 Eastern time. And they said the plane was coming at 1.30 and uh, we're leaving at 1.30, I should say. 
And uh, I landed in Lawrence. They took us out to the field. The team had just finished their walkthrough for the spring game. And that was on a Friday. And uh, met boosters and watched part of the spring game Saturday. And we went. And the semester was ending. So that was the next component. The guys were going home for two, three weeks. And then the portal was just being created. So I'm trying to meet guys and try to make sure that they know that there's going to be, a, you know, new opportunity and new vision. And, and uh, you know, we're fortunate. But also, and I think you've probably covered this along the way, um, you know, this program struggled being under scholarship, got itself upside yeah. down in, in with, with the 25 hard count. And, and the, you know, the portal, when they got rid of the hard count, we were able to, to, you know, take advantage of that and bring in players. Our portal recruiting has been very solid. I don't know if every guy, in fact, we probably have less guys in the portal that start than have, but what they've done is added that layer in the two deep that and and the constant competition in the program that we desperately needed, and and that's really helped us. And again, I, I think our players once they saw how we we're going about it, we moved to morning practices. We did some things. We said and we said what we said we we're going to do with them in and just in the day to day operations we did. And I think that started to build the trust, and we started to build confidence and. Uh, We've been able, a few players came over from Buffalo that were great leaders and also showed, uh, you know, led through example, but also showed uh, belief in what the, what we do and how it works. And I really think it helped us kind of close the gap sooner than later. Well, and you mentioned the transfer portal. The other thing, and I've heard you talk about this in press conferences, is talk about retention and how important that is. Obviously, you're bringing back Jalen Daniels at quarterback. He's he's coming off an injury, but but you're hoping to have him ready for the season, your, your corners, Kobe Bryant and Melo Dotson, those are NFL guys. How, how critical is it? Cause if you look at what you've lost in the portal, teams aren't cherry picking off you guys, even though you've got good players. Yeah. Um, you know, we lost three players to the sec in my first week on the job. And, uh, and since then we've been able to hold, we lost one this year, but all in all we've held in there pretty well. I think, you know, this was a player probably prior to the portal, um, was probably had as many uh, as much attrition as anyone in the off season. I think of mm. that off season, and I think these last two knock on wood because we have that other window coming. Yeah, is, we've been in the lower part at least of the Big Twelve, and I, I think hopefully that says about our players, our staff, the relationships, the trust, all the things you talk about. But I think like a lot of coaches, though, Andy, when when you get a text or a call that says, "Hey, can I? You got a minute?" or I talk, your your heart skips a beat because you know, um, it's, you're, you're always wondering what else is happening. And, uh, but I, I do hope that, you know, our players see that the consistency in what they have, we've tried to say that let's not make everything about transactional relationships and, and, and we're trying to do things. And, uh, so far we've been able to, they, they've been able to really resonate with that. Well, when you guys announced your contract a few weeks ago, you had a really interesting answer to a question. And then you mentioned that same thing, that, that everything's not transactional. And you said, if it was all about money, I'd be somewhere else. And you mentioned that you've, you've told your players that too. What are those conversations like with the players? And, and how do they respond to that? Because it's, it's, I can't imagine as, an, as a 19, 20, 21 year old having those conversations yeah. In a way that with dollar figures that are similar to what I deal with as a 40 something. Right. Um, you know, some of that's even done at the position coach level on the service level to do some. I'm, I I don't get deep, deep into the weeds. But like you said, you, you try to talk about it because and I, I think I've said it before in an interview like this. So I guess I'll end up getting quoted again <laughs> is <laughs> is if somebody is reaching out to you and you're not in the portal, what type of actions are happening if you decide to go there that you're not aware of that could affect you? Are there other right. conversations happening? And we just talk, hey, you know, we know we've got work to do. We're getting better. We're doing the best we can in, in NIL facilities, on the field. All we're trying to do is get a little better. But you know what? We're pretty honest about it. If somebody's reaching out and you're not there, what what value system is that? And 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 what are you lining yourself with? And because once you're there, you don't know. And um, you know, I, I'm not 
I'm not, it's, I don't have one particular one or anything, but I, I just kind of put that out to a couple of players and, and they know, and, and they kind of pause because we ask them if they've been treated fairly and, and, and whatnot here. Do you like it here? We get back to those things and, and hopefully, but like I said, we, we have lost a couple and, and we're not, and you're not always going to keep everybody happy or, or that's always going to resonate to, to every individual. Well, and, and that's, the, the thing I, I'm curious about with every coach, because, uh, you know, I thought if you can create a program where people want to play, you you might not have to have as much money to keep them because they're happy. But mm -hmm. that's that might be a little pie in the sky. How do you how do you balance having a program that players enjoy, that they like playing in, but also that holds them accountable, that has discipline? How do you how do you have both of those things? Well, it's a it's an evolving process of how we're transitioning ourselves because you know right now we're still dealing with a good portion of a roster that was not recruited with NIL at, at the forefront. You know, I, I I was telling a group I had to speak to a group the other day, and I can remember when cost of attendance came in, and you probably do as well, Andy. Where all of a sudden mm -hmm. the question got to be, what's my check? What's my monthly st extra stipend? And and that's kind of what, now it's that on steroids, you know and and when it becomes that, that, that becomes an interesting thing because there are other factors in families and families and, and things that young men are going to have to look at. But we, we try to keep it, uh, uh, you know, about the daily things of improvement and hopefully the goals of playing at the next level are still at the forefront that will help them and we give them the tools and resources to get there. I mean, right now, we're going to have a, a this will be the largest senior class I've ever been a part of. We'll have over 30 seniors. And yeah, and that's a little COVID. It's a little portal. It's a little red shirting and, and retention. And all of a sudden, boom, you have this guy's. But you know what? It's a really good group of guys. And uh, for their sake, and I, I, I think the other thing, Andy, probably I, I should have hit on earlier. I think it has to do with the relationships with themselves. They're within mm -hmm. the locker room. Amongst each other, yeah. Yeah, with each other that, you know what, you know, Jalen Daniels is a heck of a young man. So is Devin Neal. Mello, Kobe is funny and as competitive as anyone. And these are guys, they like being around each other. And, and, and as we say, you know, sometimes in the, in, in portal recruiting, and especially if there's dollar figures, you're not bringing guys in the sit, you know, sometimes yeah. when, when you replace the guy, Okay, you might come in and they're going to recruit over you through the portal, but who's who's that guy's buddy, you know, and how does that affect the rest of the locker room? And there's other dynamics, and we think about that sometimes as well. Well, I, so I was thinking about one player that is, is not on your team anymore, but I'm curious, what did Jason Bean <laughs> mean to your team? This was the, the, He was the quarterback. who he, he was a starter. He filled in for Jalen at times like the, he had so many different roles, but it seemed like there were multiple opportunities for him to leave and go somewhere else and be a starter. But he stuck it out with you guys. Yeah, personally, I, I'll, I'll always be grateful to Jason being in so many ways because I think he's almost, you know, he for what he really did to me for college football because he was a backup quarterback and knew he was going to be a backup. And actually, you know, his last play of the year before in the triple overtime game, you know, we kind of called the Philly special play or whatever. And he ends up, you know, he could have maybe tucked it and run it. He throws it. It's incomplete. We lose the game. Of course, everybody wants to pick that play or whatever. And, and that he, he already told us he was leaving. He told us he's going to try his hand at the NFL He's the fastest guy on the team. I go, what's going to happen? You run your 40. Well, they're going to ask me to play another position. I said, okay, well, then why don't we work at that other position? And, and he came back with the idea he was going to probably play as much or more receiver than he was going to play quarterback. And, you know, and then, and then Jalen gets hurt and, and can't go. Never once did he ever say, hey, wait a minute, guys, you told me I was going to get all this extra work to help me. And he really developed himself into a, to a fine quarterback. I thought the last two training camps we had, he was one of our most improved players. And to the point where scouts are, I, I sure hope he's going to get his opportunity to be in a camp. Maybe he'll be a, 
you know, uh, kind of a dual guy or some a, a special thing that he can be on a practice squad or be a backup and do some things. But what he did for this program by sticking around where where everyone else around the country seems to hit the eject button um, really says a lot. And he did a lot for for Kansas Jayhawk football. Well, it, it sounds like that's the the kind of environment you're trying to foster and, and help, you know, find those guys. Mm -hmm. and, and it seems like you've got a group of those guys now. So uh, Lance, you're in spring practice now. Cannot wait to see what you guys look like uh, on the on the soccer pitch and on the, uh, the Chiefs field. <laughs> it's going to be a lot of fun. So. Yeah, you know, you start working about, you know, you start thinking locker room sizes and press boxes. <laughs> And, well, thank goodness the uh, our guaranteed rate bowl was at a baseball stadium. So we we learned to uh, you know you're all and, set. Uh, you know, yeah, you, you learn to adapt. And heck, half the staff has made 13 hour bus trips. Heck, if we got to play in some other stadiums for a little outside of town, we'll be okay. <laughs> Cannot wait, Lance. Thank you so much. Appreciate it, Andy. Thanks for the opportunity. Such a great chat with Lance Leipold. I can talk to that guy all day. He is so fascinating to me because he has now done this at the Division Three level. He's done it at the Group 5 level. He's doing it at the Power 5 level. And again, I'm one of those people who takes degree of difficulty of a job very seriously. What he took over, he should not have been able to get them this far this fast. But he's done it. So... We'll see. And I, I, I do believe I, when I asked that question about what he's done, what Chris Kleiman's done at Kansas State, what you saw Kalen DeBoer do at Washington, and now he's on to Alabama. Yeah, I, I do think athletic directors should look more carefully at the lower levels of college football, at the people who are just winning, who are good CEOs, because I do think that probably matters more than anything when it comes to being a successful head coach doesn't mean everybody's going to be able to jump up levels. But I think during the interview process, you talk to enough people, you can figure it out. That's one thing I learned talking to Danny White about his decision to hire Lance Leipold at Buffalo. And Danny White is now Tennessee's AD. And he just, he said it became very clear that Lance Leipold understood the foundational pieces of winning, understood how the CEO role worked. And then Danny's thing was he can figure out how to use all the bells and whistles. He can figure out the recruiting piece of it if he, he helped put the right people around him. And he did. He absolutely has. He did it at Buffalo. He's done it so far at Kansas. At, even as college football has been changing considerably. And also, you know, I think a guy who's gone from Division Three to Division One probably is a little more equipped to roll with those changes than somebody who's been in the same place the whole time. So really interesting guy. So glad he came on the show. We're going to hear more from him before we get into the season. I, I love talking to him, so we will have Lance back on. But now we got to talk about a coach who is not as beloved at his place as Lance Leipold is at his place. Uh, John Calipari was at one point the most beloved. He could do no wrong at one point at Kentucky. But now it has become a pretty combustible situation John Calipari went on his radio show on Monday night. I suspect that means he's the coach at Kentucky next year. We talked on Friday about the buyout being doable, not impossible, even though it's $33 million. But it's also still a lot of money. And John Calipari always brings in good players. And I think that piece of it allows you to say, you know, maybe we can try one more time. You know, if it wasn't a case where he was bringing in really good players, where his rosters weren't always good, then maybe you're willing to, to write the checks that it would take to change. But the idea that you've got good players coming in still, you can maybe give it one more try. But as you'll hear when we talk to Nick Roush from Kentucky Sports Radio, there's a significant portion of the Kentucky fan base that is pretty much out on Cal. He's going to have to win them back. And the only way to do that is you win games when it matters. And the problem is it's going to be a while before they play another one of those games. And how do you handle the intervening time? Here's Nick Roush. I promised we'd have him back 
whether Kentucky won or lost in the first week in the NCAA tournament. But Nick Roush, I did not expect you to be here under such interesting circumstances. Monday night, we listened to Cal on a radio show sort of plead for his job. I, you know, Andy, I, I, I wanted to come on here and like scream and do a whole dog and pony show for all you sickos out there who love to see Kentucky lose. I, I'm, I'm happy, you know, dance. I'll, I'll dance for you. Right. But I can't, it, it, it's, it was so weird, right? Like it's not, they did it again. And it was, it was so, it was so bad. It was sad. And that was, I think that was the biggest difference between Kentucky losing to Oakland in 2024 versus Kentucky losing to St. Peter's in 2022. There was a, there was an anger of like, how, what is wrong with you? And then this was a, like I found out my, my dog's dying. He's an old dog. He, I, he's got some time to go, but his, his best days are done, right? He's an old dog. It's going to happen. It's what I felt like it was with John Calipari. Like the coach that I knew, that was awesome back when I was in college and gave me some of the happiest moments of my life. He doesn't have the same pep in his step. He doesn't sound the same. He doesn't coach the same. And they've just been bad. And they've been bad in such unusual ways that, like, this team, when you looked at them, they, they did all the things that they were supposed to be able to do to go on that run and to see them flame out. Because they couldn't guard a white guy who only shot threes, a set shooting Jack Golke that took three dribbles. How? How? What? You can't coach. You can't, you can't coach that guy for making a shot. What? What? I, I, I can't understand how we got to this point with John Calipari. But I was overwhelmingly sad Thursday night. Just like, well, this is it. Like he's done. He can't. He he clearly doesn't have it anymore. But he's on his radio show Monday night. Now, that doesn't mean, well, I'll ask you, because you understand the dynamics of this better than I do. Mitch Barnhart is not the type of person who would let John Calipari go on his coach's radio show and then fire him the next day. Like That, that doesn't seem to fit the pattern of the SEC's longest tenured athletic director throughout his career. He, he Mitch? Has, I don't want to say universal, but like part of the reason why people respect him so much is because he gave Mark Stoops time when everybody wanted Mark Stoops fired and he gave him that little extra rope. And now he's got the winningest football coaching Kentucky program history. But it's still just this day on the internet. I don't know if any of y'all were on KS Board. If you're not a member of KSR Plus or On3 Plus, wherever you can read it, it's been wild. I mean, Fred, why not Don Staley? Why not Will Wade? Why not this coach? There was a guy who did Calipari burner and like poses Calipari doing an AMA. It was ridiculous. It was insanity. And it's, I mean, six times throughout the day, I thought Cal was either going to be gone or he was going to stay because Andy, as you pointed out on Friday, the buyout, it wasn't, didn't really seem to be an issue. And in an unusual twist too, there wasn't any sort of leaks on it was leaning this way or another. But what I thought was weird is that, I don't know, like Cal, part of his pleading on his coach show, Andy, he was talking about how much he loved this state and the expectations and this job. He loves this job so much. But he was calling in from his beach house in New Jersey instead of meeting <laughs> with his boss after one of the worst losses in the history of the program. So it's just a little, it's just a little weird. Well, it was interesting listening to the show. And we're, we're going to play some clips from the show. but. It answered kind of a question that I had over the weekend. And my question over the weekend was based on listening to Cal in the immediate aftermath of the Oakland game, where he, he was asked, have you considered changing your roster strategy? Have you considered changing your recruiting strategy? And he said, I don't want to change because I like helping young men as if helping an 18 year old is somehow different or better than helping a 22 year old. Like they're still young adults and you're still helping them mm. one way or the other. But like my question after that statement was, do you know what your job is? Like your job is not to create the best group of NBA alums. Your job is to create teams that win titles. Like, well, and, and more specifically, 
and I say this in football all the time with certain jobs. John Calipari's job is to win the national title. Bill Self's job is to win the national title. Kalen DeBoer, the new Alabama football coach, his job is to win the national title. Ryan Day's job is to win the national title. Like, mm -hmm. it's not fair, but that's the job. And I'm not entirely sure Cal understood that. And then I heard him say, I understand that. I heard him say, I, the standard here is championships. So maybe he's just saying that, but at least I've now heard him verbalize that. Which he hasn't done as of late. That's that's the part where I know there might be some people on the outside looking in, like you, you Kentucky fans are crazy. Like was, who wouldn't want John Calipari to coach their team? But it's not verbalizing that. It's you know he he said one quote: uh, our players were sad after the game, and the fans were angry. It's like no, Cal, we. We were said, like, I don't think he understands how much not only we love this, but also that you're right. Those expectations are high. And when you know it year after year that I'm going to do X or I'm going to do Y or I'm going to do Z, and that's been the thing before. And that's where we've gotten to this point is that there's been a, well, we went too young. We're going to go to the portal. They did the portal. They got the national player of the year. They lost in the first round of the NCAA tournament. They need more offense. What do they do? They get more offense. They recruit a Kentucky kid, a legacy recruit, who's the national freshman of the year. And what do they do? They lose in the first round of the NCAA tournament. And I, I know there's a clip that we want to play. Um, and it's it's what his big change is for this year. And it's the one that I think is the most – it's like it's hardest to sell for me because he says absolutely nothing that would actually fix the problems they had with their defense. Here we go. Well, it's we just removed from the season. Uh, but every year, I go through that process of evaluating everything in the program. Um, and you go through whether it's all the people around you or whether it's how we're doing things. I'll give you an example. And, and I haven't gone through everything right now. But my thoughts defensively and physicality. How do we get back there? What about in the summers, instead of a Bahamas or a Toronto, we're really back to where we're grinding and we're working on our physicality and we're working on defense and we're trying to set a foundation of who we're going to be because I don't want to change offensively. I mean, it was fun coaching it. Our fans loved it. Obviously, the nation loved it because we were the highest rated TV game all of our games, I mean, we're, you know, if there were 13, 12 games, we were in the top six of them. So I don't want to change that. But I know, and I've always known, that your defense steadies you when you're not making shots. Or you get a little anxious and you're, you're, you're turning it, you're missing shots, you don't use, your defense settles you. Um, and there's a game where your offense is going to have to be good and your defense. But we got to get back to that. So that being one thing that I've thought about, um, you know, what do we do in the spring? How do we do this? And I've not worked on defense that early ever, and it's never been a problem. But I think now I'm looking at it saying, I think that's one thing we're going to have to do. No tour of the Bahamas in the summer. No games against the University of Nassau JV. That'll solve it. That'll make them play great defense. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's what's going to help them play good defense. And I also love, too, that it's like he, he just had three bean pole seven-footers, and he's like, you know what? We need more physicality. It's like, well, yeah, I could have told you that those guys weren't going to be good rebounders, right? Like, it's it's pretty clear and obvious they're going to get pushed around by the 24-year-old men. It, and you know what? Physicality, Andy, it's correct to an extent. But here's what the biggest problem is. It's not having a freaking clue. Like, you need to coach your players. They were spending time before the NCAA tournament going around in a room talking to each other about why they believe they can go on a run. Like, it's uh, Andy or uh, Michael Scott in the office passing the ball around the room to tell sad stories. Like, <laughs> no, 
teach them how to guard Rob Dillingham. The one thing you cannot do when you were down by one point in the NCAA tournament with 30 seconds left is leave the guy open in a corner for a three. It, it, like, wh- how do you not have the awareness? Like, how are – I just uh, – that – Cal has always been – a great defensive coach, and he thought he could put in a bunch of shot blockers, and all of a sudden they'd be good at defense again. Well, you know what, Cal? You got good shot blockers this year. You were third in the country in block cuts, but you were 111th in Ken Palm defense. It's the worst Kentucky defense in the history of the Ken Palm rankings. The worst ever. And it's because, Andy, now players don't just drive to the room to score. They shoot a lot of threes, so you have to have better perimeter defenders to guard. And to act like none of them are incapable of guarding two is Bull crap. Reed Shepard had the most seals in the SEC. So to act like that somehow these guys just like have an inability to guard, it's not true. They haven't been playing good defense for five years. I, I spend the games just bitching and moaning with my friends about the pick and roll defense because they haven't done it in five years. That was the last time they had a top 20 Ken Palm defense. They went to the Elite Day. They lost overtime to Bruce Pearl. Their best defense since then was 35th, all right? The defense has just been bad, and Cal's been bad at it, and it's not because he liked physical players. You know who was physical? Oscar Shibwe, and they still <laughs> suck the defense. It is, it is interesting. I, I'm i starting to think there's a, there's a better football compare. I keep making the Jimbo Fisher comparison, but I think there's a better one. I think it's Dabo. I think Dabo oh, might be the gosh. comparison. That's the the second game time keeps I've heard changing. That in the last week. <laughs> well, and but think about it. Both of them still recruit very well. Both of them mm-hmm. still, you know, if, if the player stays, if the players around, they they get developed. They do they do tend to become very good. Now the difference is Dabo has to like players have to stay with Dabo for three years mm-hmm. before they go to the NFL. But and they're pretty good in the that NFL. Part too. part of it. Yeah, Yeah. that part of it works. But other things have changed within the game that everybody else has evolved with, and they haven't. I think that there is, like, you know, Cal has made his concerted efforts, but just the the, the worst part, all this, Andy, is that we have to, like, start accepting some of the things the haters said as truths. Cal can't coach. He just rolls the ball out there. And it's like, you you fought against that forever. And now I'm just like, oh, man, what if he's right? Like, what? <laughs> Maybe it just was a perfect storm with Anthony Davis and Michael Kidd Gilchrist and, and Deron Lamb and, and Terrence Jones didn't go one or- and done and came back and Darius Miller was there. Maybe that was a perfect <laughs> storm. Like maybe Aaron Harrison just pulled some stuff out of his rear end and like they got lucky. I mean, Brandon Knight had to hit two really big shots for them to go to that first final four. And so, yeah, that that's the part where you just, you just start thinking like, wow, is, I mean, is Cal closer to two national titles or zero? You know, like, you're just like, eh, everything. I was there for the he, one. He was winning that one. <laughs> he was winning yeah. that one. But he did need a pretty big block from MKG to get it there. But there, there's still, it's just, that's, that's the part is that each year, Andy, like we're having to do the same thing we did for so many years. And that's, well, next year they're going to have some good players. Like maybe they can do it. And it's gotten to the point where, I mean, it's, it's this next group of guys, I don't know who it's going to be. Is Reed Shepard going to come back? DJ Wagner? Like, I mean, they could have a really talented roster. But now Cal has backed himself into a corner because it's all been about March. Well, now that pressure's up even more because, I mean, you know how hard it is to believe that a team that went to Knoxville and beat Tennessee two Saturdays ago didn't win another game? And you know what? That's all that matters. That Tennessee win that was awesome doesn't really matter. Yep. Now, in terms of, of the evolution, and this is where it's interesting because it is a bunch of good new players coming in. Now, the question is, are they all going to be freshmen? Will it be uh, you know a mix of transfers? Will it be some returning players? Because all of those things change the dynamics. And Cal got asked about that on the radio show about playing against older players. Now everybody's old because everybody recruits the portal so much. Could Cal decide to have a roster that looks more like everybody else's? Uh, getting this back to where everybody wants it to be, you and fans included. Well, it's it's winning 
the, the, the end of the season stuff and we'll talk about it, but it's, uh, you know, um, having this program in today's environment, it's a little different now. I mean, kids are 25, 26, 27. Now, how do you continue to do it with freshmen? What do they have to look like physically? And how do you bring in some transfers out of that portal to make up for your team? Some people are not taking any freshmen. They're just going in the per- portal on 12 new guys and hope it works out. I would just tell you, I like the combination of both. We just got to get the right transfer who understands what this is. Um, we got to keep coaching these young kids. We probably got to use the summer a little bit different um, because of where this is all gone. We got to get more physicality, more time in the weight room. What what are what are the goals we're going to set for each kid physically? Um, but on top of that, we got to first of all see who's going to be here from this roster and who won't be here. Well, that weight room part, you got to answer that last question before you can get to the weight room part. Because, like, if Reed Shepard and DJ Wagner are back a year older, having, you know, more than a full year in a college weight program as opposed to, to just coming in and leaving, like, that would be a big difference. But if they're not coming back, you probably need to get that sort of size and bulk and age out of the portal like antonio reeves who was the high scoring score in a single season in the calipari era you know yes. he so and that that's the part that it like we just keep going like yes you need to do that you have to do that every year you've got to do more with that now i could here's some a fun little rotating door the year that kentucky got antonio reeves from the portal he's a two-year mm-hmm. player another guy they were recruiting that they missed out on who is a big physical guy playing in sweet 16 this game terrence shannon and i know there's a oh, lot of other stuff yeah. with him off the court now, there's, yeah there's, been... there's other stuff to talk about but yeah on the on the court on the basketball court he, he exactly he what they would have been looking for yes Keisha johnson that's playing for arizona right now whose three point shots got a lot better than what he was doing last year at san diego state he's another guy that Kentucky kind of mixed with, and then they they missed out on. So it's it's not that they haven't thought about it or tried to do it previously, but now it's to the point where it's like, well, you can't miss. And then how many how many guys want want that, right? Like I know yeah. money in the nil plays a big part in it, but for all these guys, returners, incoming freshmen, it's, it's going to be a pressure cooker next year. If uh, Mitch Barnhart doesn't do the unthinkable and decides to can Cal, which that was the big Andy going into this day, we were just like, well, is Cal if Cal does his show, he's got to be the coach, right? But well, Cal and Mitch, they're they're going to meet, aren't they? I, yeah, I guess. I well, guess Cal Cal not. answered that question on the show. Let's let's hear his answer, and then I, I have a, a question for you based on that. A lot of noise out there and rumors, etc. So let's start with this. I assume that there's some type of meeting that happens at the end of the season, just like there is in the corporate world. There's a performance review of sorts. Does that happen with you and Mitch? And if so, has it happened yet? Yeah, we do it every year and uh, we haven't, but it'll be done in the next couple of days. And every year we share thoughts with each other. And I'm sure he's hurting. I was on the plane back. He's hurting like the rest of us. And I look forward to hearing his thoughts, you know, what, how we can be better. But let me say this right now, I've got to turn my attention to this current team. I have individual meetings set up. My staff has been spending time with the guys because we got to find out where are they right now? And where are they as they're going to go through the process? who's going through it and how we're doing that. So we've got to live through that stuff right now. Um, the immediate, but I, I will, my guess is we'll meet Mitch and I will meet tomorrow. All right. So I'm going to put you in Mitch Barnhart shoes, Nick. So you may have to calm down a little bit from the the way you've been through most of this proceeding here. Uh, Mitch is a very measured person, uh, for those who never talked to him. Yeah. Yeah. Button that top button. All right. So, (laughs) 
you're Mitch Barnhart. You're meeting with John Calipari, assuming you are not firing him, which I don't think you are because you would have probably already done that. Mm -hmm. What do you want to see from him that says next year is going to be different? Well, John, um, it's been a difficult time and we can make this better. And it's winning cures all, but you can help the other stuff. You can damage broke relationships, bond that bridge, so to speak. You can talk to those boosters. All those guys that you thought you didn't need to hobnob with, you should. You should talk with me, you know, your boss. All of those people that work with us, we have to work together. And we all have to be pulling on the same rope. And that can't be with some of the guys that you have on your coaching staff. It just isn't working. And you know what? When you get new guys, you got to listen to them. This isn't the John Perry show. This is Kentucky basketball. This is bigger than you. And we all need to get on the same page. Zandy, that, that's the other part that if your your big picture audience doesn't understand is that a lot of cows, a lot of the people that were in Cal's corner, they were happy with him doing his own thing. But boosters, they, they like... They they like getting their butts kissed by the head coach. Cal yeah. hasn't played that game. He he hasn't played that game in years. And now the the Pod Piper is playing his flute. Yeah, I I do think, and I don't know, like if he were to come back and start suddenly start glad handing all the boosters, trying to have a good relationship with Mitch Barnard. I don't know that anybody's going to buy that <laughs> at this point. My thing yeah, is the too. only thing that matters is do you win championships or do you not and in basketball it, we, we actually had this discussion on the show yesterday uh, James Fletcher and I were talking about when you when you're in, at a program that expects to win championships like what's acceptable how deep do you have to go and we were talking about Rick Barnes and you know how far does he have to go at what point does the Rick Barnes narrative but like Rick Barnes is in the in the, in the sweet 16 they're playing Creighton like, mm -hmm. if if they were to lose to them, like, there's no shame in that. That's a very good team. Like, if you get to a point where you're deeper in the tournament and you're just playing good teams, sometimes you lose. That's okay. But you keep getting there. Like, Mark Few, great example. Yeah, yeah. Nine consecutive Sweet 16s. Like, he's put them in the mix. He's never gotten over the hump of winning the title. He's gotten to the title game. But they keep coming back. They keep knocking out. So that's like you don't do any, you don't change anything there. But when you can't get out of the first weekend, that's where it's a problem. Because like you've mentioned earlier, they've changed some roster construction strategy. They've changed some scheme. The one constant has been Cal. Yes. And, and the results haven't changed. No. No. And – the other part of this too is like, I know you're correct in that. I mean, they don't they don't hang SEC championship banners, right? It's all Final Fours, and that's it, right? Rep arena. But you can you can get a little extra goodwill bought up if you win the SEC regular champion, season championship or you win the SEC conference tournament championship. When Tubby Smith lost to UAB in 2004 as the number one overall seed. I might be mistaken. It might have actually been the year before, but I think that was the first time anybody had ever gone undefeated in SEC regular season and conference tournament play. Like We didn't think that Tubby forgot how to coach because they got upset one round. It's the fact that not only are, are they not winning the tournament, but they're not winning SEC regular season or tournament championships, and then Cal acts like those don't matter when they do. Like We, we care about going to Nashville, kicking everybody's ass, tearing up Broadway and having ourselves a hell of a weekend. And he like that those are there's a lot of easy wins out there for Calipari. I think to your original point, I don't know if anybody's gonna buy this all, all the whole entire off season. And it's it's gonna make it incredibly uncomfortable. Like it's just I, it's gonna be so uncomfortable. It it is, but if we're sitting here next year and they're preparing for the sweet sixteen then it's not, it's going to be fine. 
Uh, and if we're sitting here next year and they're out of the tournament, Kentucky's going to be paying a large buyout. Like that, I, I don't think there's there's any other way you go with that. Yeah, and and even then though, that, then you ask the question: Is Sweet Sixteen enough? Probably not. Enough? <laughs> you know, like probably. And that it's 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 going to be a long off season, Andy. We're going to be asking those questions, and I I just I don't. I don't know what's going to be enough, and that's going to be. It's just. It's going to be so. Oh, I. I predicted it would be an uncomfortable off season. Well, on the show last week, I did not anticipate it would. I mean, I'm squeamish just thinking about it. We're on day three. <laughs> Good news though, Cal loves Kentucky. He said it a lot. That standard of national titles has been here from Coach Rupp on. And the only thing that I'm saying to all our fans, I'm a, you know, I'm a work, work in our state, work for this program and this university, really work for these young people. And that's my commitment. I'm not changing 24 seven. Let's go. Uh, whether it's recruiting all the stuff that we've got to do, that is a commitment that I give to the fans that I haven't changed. This is, this is the this is like wearing a coat. It never goes away. But I love it. This is what I want. This is what I wanted. This is why I never left. This is it. And now it's let's come together and let's go do something. Let's do something special. And we can do it. We've done it. Let's do it again. I love that. I never left. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I don't I don't want to sound like just like a uh like a dog whistle is going off and I'm just this cow hater but I just heard I'm not changing I haven't changed and <laughs> yeah, like that's I think he's talking about work ethic there I don't think he was really saying I'm not changing the things that don't work though no, I know that's what a lot of people heard I I remember looking on Twitter <laughs> as he spoke those words, and I was like, oh, boy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, maybe if you did the show in person instead of over the phone, you know, you might have been a little From more Jersey. careful with the word choice. But, you know, it, at least, like, it was a good effort, and, like, uh, he kind of cared and acted like he wanted to have the job because there's been a lot of times lately where he just looks miserable when he's up there at the podium, except for that time they beat Auburn, and he came in, like, peacocking with his chest puffed out and was like, I thought I was going to lose. Ha <laughs> ha. I did lose. And then. Well, I think there's a little more to that because you know who really, if we're being honest, if, J if John Calipari weren't the basketball coach at Kentucky, who the perfect basketball coach for Kentucky would be, it'd be Bruce Pearl. He's the rock star Kentucky needs. He. But that ain't I, happening. I, 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 it's, it's not. And I, but like the thought experiment of it potentially happening. I just I don't know if we can handle like another John Calipari right away. Like I, I think our our <laughs> it's DNA, true. Like but it would be like projected. it would be like 2009 Calipari and not 2024 Calipari. He would be just sweating, just firing up the oh, like people. Oh, he it would it would take us have... no time, and we'd be eating out the palm of his hand. Oh, 100 percent. And he doesn't have to wear the suits anymore. He wears athleisure now, so he doesn't have to sweat through it. But it's Cal. Unless, uh, unless Mitch Barnhart wants to get really wild on Tuesday or on Wednesday, excuse me. It's, it's Cal. It's going to be Cal. And Cal filibustered right up until the end on his radio show on, on, on Monday night. And, uh, well, Nick, you and I have both done radio. We know how bad the hard out can be. There were times that I played um, Big Z 20 minutes. There were times that I left Aaron in. And probably looking back, I should have let him in there even when he got a third foul, let him play because he was playing well. Should have left him alone. But you know what? Here's the thing I want to tell you when you're coaching. About 10 seconds here, Tim. Whatever you do when you win, you were perfect. And whatever you do when you lose, you should have done the other. It's, how, it's what you accept. And you accept people have opinions and they, they get mad and they – you know, and the only thing this has been the UK Healthcare John Calipari Show. Ending to the hardest part.
Thanks for watching the Andy Staples on three. We'll talk to you tomorrow.